All right, good evening, everyone. It is seven o'clock. And uh, I know in some cases, we try to start things uh, a few minutes later to allow people to join on. And we are still having a few people join up, but um, in respect to those that have, have been on for some time and are wanting to hear their information. And since it's evening, we are gonna go ahead and get started. So on behalf of uh, uh, IDNR fisheries biologist, Blake Rubush, extension educators, Jay Solomon and myself, Dwayne, welcome to this pond webinar. This is something that uh, we knew we would have quite a bit of interest in and we did and we are, were excited about that. And we know that you have a lot of uh, questions that you want hopefully answered and hopefully we'll get to those today. Uh, we've got our three speakers. I'm gonna be on first. We're each allotted about 20 minutes to talk. So that will take us up to about eight o'clock and then the last 30 minutes, we're gonna leave open for questions. And any questions that you have, please place them in the chat box. We will try to address them on a first come first serve basis, try to get through the ones that we can in that 30 minute time frame. And um, with that, I am going to go ahead and get started. And we know the reason that 99% of you are on tonight. You have a question about your fish. You have a question about pond weed control. You may have a question about how to take care of a leak. I'm not gonna be covering any of those right at the moment, but I am gonna be covering something that hopefully you will find uh, you still should have some interest in because it's dealing with fish. And that is talking a little bit about oxygen in the water and how that oxygen level changes naturally throughout the year. A lot of times we get questions right about uh, June through August. And sometimes they're very frantic questions about what should I do? I have this, this fish kill taking place. And a lot of times people immediately wanna to go to the potential for pesticide poisoning or something like that. 99% of the time, it's a natural fish kill and it's caused by lack of oxygen. So I wanna talk just a little bit about that tonight. Now, just a little bit on the background. Why do we call it a pond and not a lake? Well, that, that's kind of a, a gray area, but IDNR kind of, uh, set the, the bar back in 1988, when they said that ponds are considered to be a non-free flowing body of water that's less than 20 acres. And it's gonna be something that's built either by being dug out or by being dammed up and having an expansion of that, that water area. And the thing with ponds that happens pretty often is because of that smaller watershed, sometimes you can have a lot of water flowing in there, sometimes not very much, and that can change that water level. And that can affect the pond as well. But let's talk a little bit about the, some of the physical properties of a pond. And there's two things that I wanna talk about with this. Two things I wanna focus on is water temperature and how that affects layering in the pond. At certain times of the year when you have these layers of water that set up and that water really doesn't mix. So right now, this time of year, We've got lots of wind, we've got movement of water. We don't really have to worry about that. We're getting the, the water fairly well mixed. The water is relatively cool. Around, there's plenty of oxygen in there. As we move through the, the late spring and into the summer months though, we start having a layering or a stratification that takes place. As those water temperatures warm up, especially on the surface, that warmer water, is less dense. So it's exactly where it wants to be. It wants to be up at the top. Below that, where the water is not heating up as much, you have significantly cooler water. And if anybody has dove into a fairly deep pond in the past, you probably noticed that, that once you dive down, you, you go through that warmer water that's close to the surface, you go through a pretty narrow area where there's a pretty rapid temperature change, and then you get into that cooler water. That warmer water is up at the top where it wants to be. The cold water is denser, heavier. It stays down at the bottom. So you don't get that mixing of water. And over time, two things happen. First of all, that colder water down near the bottom, it has a lot of organic matter in it because you got all that muck and stuff sitting down there at the bottom. Microbes are still breaking that material down. And the oxygen levels, in that colder water start to decline. 
Up at the top, you've got warmer water. Warmer water, just by its nature, can't hold as much oxygen as colder water. So it starts losing its oxygen. So what you end up with by about mid to late summer is a pond overall doesn't have a huge amount of oxygen in it. We get into the fall, we do sometimes rain events that have cooler water in it. That colder water will drop down to the uh, drain into the bottom of that pond. It'll mix that uh, pond back up. And we're gonna talk about uh, seasonal overturns here in just a little bit. But vacation, that layering goes away during the fall. During the winter, you can have another type of layering set up. And we kind of experienced that a little bit in February this year. If you get that colder water, water will continue to get denser until it reaches about 39 degrees. Point, as it gets colder, it actually starts expanding. And we know what happens with ice, ice, that's at 32 degrees, gets bigger, it expands. And we know that because where does that ice sit? It sits on top of the pond. If it didn't do that, if that ice was denser, where would it end up at? At the bottom of the pond, nothing for your fish. You'd end up having a fish kill probably every year when that happened. So what you end up with in the winter months is that less dense ice up at the top at 32 degrees, but that acts as a natural protection, allowing that colder water, or not colder water, but cold water, 39 degrees, that's at its max density, to stay near the bottom. That allows for those fish to survive during the winter time. At the same time, you can have a situation where oxygen starts going down in the pond during the winter time because of that ice. You're not getting that interaction of, of oxygen. We're going to talk more about that here in just a, just a second. Now, if you have a, a not very deep pond, you may not have to worry about any of this stratification during the summer, especially. And a lot of ponds out there that are 25, 30, 50 years old, they probably lost well over half their original volume. So something may have started out at 20 feet deep and it was built 35, 40 years ago, may not be hardly even eight feet deep today if you've got enough sedimentation going on in there. The other thing that'll break up that stratification, especially in the summertime, late summer, is if you get a cold rain. That cold water will run in and it'll drain down to the bottom of that pond and it'll actually push that water that's already there up to the surface. Now that leads to a fish kill because remember that cold water that's down at the bottom has a lot of organic matter in it, has very little oxygen. And that's when you see that, that overturn where the, brown, the water looks really brown and murky for a couple of days, very little oxygen in that water. And you can end up with a fish kill in some situations with that. Again, as those surface temperatures are start to cool off in the fall, like in October, November, those areas, that layering disappears. And we get windier conditions, especially in the fall and winter. And as long as you're getting a lot of interaction there on the surface and that water is allowed to move around, you don't have to worry as much about oxygen under those situations. And the reason I'm talking about this, hopefully everybody realizes the reason, is because fish need oxygen. So they need to have a good oxygen supply to survive. And there's two ways that oxygen gets into the pond. It's through that interaction with the atmosphere itself. But another way that it gets it is through synthetic activity from plants. Now, the question comes up, do you want to have a perfectly pristine pond with no pond plants, perfectly clear? And hopefully everybody is shaking their head no, because that is not what you want. That is not a natural situation. And in fact, you're kind of shooting for it. You should have somewhere between 10, 15, 20% pond plants around in that pond, because those are doing a number of different those, pond, those plants that are rooted into the shoreline are helping protect that shoreline from erosion. You're also getting a shelter area with those plants for those smaller fish that are trying to get away from predators. 
they're also a food source for some fish. And the other benefit of having some of those plants in there is that they're helping cycle some of those nutrients that are draining into that pond from the watershed above. And the other benefit is oxygen. Through that photosynthetic activity, they're actually pumping oxygen into the water. So as long as they're alive, they're being a benefit by adding oxygen. Now, what you're gonna see on a daily cycle is something like this. Early morning, oxygen levels not very high because there hasn't been photosynthetic activity going on. But as that ramps up, you come up to a maximum oxygen level, typically in sometime in the afternoon. And then as the sun starts going down in the evening and then you get to nighttime, there's no photosynthetic activity, oxygen levels go back down. And typically what you'll see is your lowest oxygen levels are right around sunrise in a lot of cases. The other thing to remember is the temperature of the water affects how well that water can actually have dissolved oxygen in it. The warmer the temperature or the warmer the water is, the less dissolved oxygen that water can hold. And again, we get a lot of questions starting in about June, July, August, when people are starting to experience some fish kills. And part of that reason may be, especially if we've had a warm stretch of weather, those uh, temperatures on those ponds are getting really warm and they simply cannot hold much dissolved oxygen. In the winter, and I talked about this just a little bit ago, if you have ice on that surface, yeah, it will seal off that interaction with the atmosphere, but if, that, if there's no snow on that ice and it's not all that thick, if there's even a little bit of sunlight that can get through that, you can still have a little bit of photosynthetic activity, yes, even in the wintertime, with little microbes that are, that are in that water, and you can still be adding a little bit of oxygen into it. But if you get snow cover on that ice and no, no sunlight can get through it, you can have a major fish kill in the middle of winter. And the thing with that is, you're not even gonna know what's happened because it's gonna be long gone, you're not gonna see it when that ice melts. You may not notice it until you go out and throw that fishing pole in and you're not hardly catching anything or nothing. Another thing that can really put a lot of demand on the, on the oxygen supply is something like this. And this is where we get a lot of questions too. You have a, a huge algae bloom and yeah, that's all right while those plants are there, but a short period of time, a lot of that algae starts to die out. Microbes start decomposing that organic matter. No. Microbes to function, they have to have oxygen. And so as that algae starts to die out, you have a huge oxygen demand. And that also can lead to a fish kill. Sediment can also cause a problem with uh, oxygen levels, among other things a lot of sediment in the water, it will actually make that temperature warmer because it can absorb sunlight and absorb that heat, which is also going to lead to lower oxygen. You're going to have less photosynthetic activity of the plants in there. If it's got too much sediment, it's not going to be good for fish because it'll clog their gills in some cases. And if you've got site feeders, they're not going to be able to function either. Add to that any type of organic matter that's decaying. So be between the sediment particles and the decaying organic matter, you can have a, a just a huge, huge amount of more oxygen being taken out of that pond. So again, some of the things to think about with this, photosynthetic activity. You gotta have a few plants on there. A few plants are okay because that's adding oxygen in there. You just don't want so many that it's gonna die off all at once and deplete the oxygen really quickly. When you got wind and wave action, that helps stir up that water, helps add oxygen in there. Uh, again, we already talked about the decomposition in the pond. The time of day makes a difference. Again, night or uh, early morning, right about sunrise is when you typically have your lowest oxygen levels. Uh, volume of water can make a difference and we already talked about temperature. The warmer the temperature, the less oxygen 
less dissolved oxygen that water can hold. This is not what you wanna see early in the morning. If you go out on your pond right around sunrise and you see big fish up at the surface look like they're gasping for air, that's telling you that oxygen level is critical. And hopefully you can do something fairly quickly to counteract that. Otherwise, you may end up having fish die off. So what can you do? Well, I'm gonna spend just a little bit of time talking about aerators. And this is the one that will probably do the best job for you, a surface agitator. It's gonna provide the, the most interaction between the atmosphere and that water. It's gonna allow the most dissolved oxygen to be added into the water. Now there's other types of, of aerators that can be used, fountains. Uh, they're, not, they're not all that bad. They, they are pretty, they're aesthetically pleasing. Uh, they're probably not gonna be quite as efficient as the agitators, but they will still add oxygen. Bubblers, bubblers uh, have pros and cons also. If you put a bubbler down at the bottom of the pond and it will keep stratification or that layering from happening in that area. It's not gonna cover the entire pond if you've got an, a big pond, but it will break up that layering in that one area. One drawback from that is if you add a bubbler into an old pond that's got a lot of muck down at the bottom, it's going to probably bring a lot of that up to the surface, just like a, a overturn would. And you may not really be adding any oxygen into it. You may be actually making the situation worse because you're moving all this organic matter around into the pond. You probably have seen some solar and wind powered aerators out there. And yes, they do function, but Think about when they're probably going to be working the hardest, the time when you really don't need them, which is during the day. Solar power, unless they've got some kind of battery system on them, uh, they're going to be working. They're going to be working during the day at nighttime. They're not going to be functioning when you really need that oxygen in the water. Wind, typically, our strongest winds are in midday time and die down at night, and so those two uh, kind of work not at the best time of when you need them. Not to say that they don't have some benefit, but um, nighttime is really when you do need that, that aerator the most. If you have an emergency situation, what can you do? Well, if you do have a boat with a motor on it that you can uh, move around, a, a, a boat, um, motor on the back of the boat, try to get that into the pond, try to angle that as much as you can so that you're getting at least some movement, bubbling of water, and try to move that around and, and agitate the water as much as possible to try to get some more interaction with the atmosphere. Uh, just briefly on ponds and nutrients, and I, I didn't really touch on this very much, but a lot of times when we're dealing with a rural setting, we got a lot of nitrogen and phosphorus coming off on the runoff, and those high nutrients will cause large amounts of plant growth. And so that's something else that you have to kind of try to manage as best you can. Sometimes it's unmanageable because the watershed is such that you really can't have much control on it. But if you can, then that's a good thing. Uh, the only thing I'm gonna mention with pH is that um, a very acidic pH, something below five can cause problems. We really don't have to worry about that uh, on most areas. Now, I know in some areas where the, maybe it's from reclaimed mines and those types of things, you may have that situation, but most normal farm ponds shouldn't really have to worry about that a whole lot. And like I said, having some plant material around on the pond is a good thing. Having those dead trees around there, um, will provide some habitat for, for the, the small fish, uh, will provide uh, food for insects and things that may fall off that, can, that fish can use also. So again, not having that perfectly pristine pond is, is okay. Again, having those living trees along there, that provides shade along the shoreline, provides erosion control along the shoreline, uh, so having a few trees there. Now, you do not want the trees on the dam itself, but they're along the, the rest of the shoreline. That's okay. If you have a really murky pond, you need, might want to think about sediment basins. 
And I'm gonna show this really quick. Uh, this is from Purdue. Uh, they have a really good website on pond and wildlife management. So again, that if, uh, just do a, a search for Purdue pond or pond um, aquatic wildlife management at Purdue to bring the website up and uh, very good information. And that is it. Uh, again, thank you. Uh, if you have any questions, again, just put them in the chat box. We'll try to get to them uh, after that last speaker is done. Now, for those of you that registered in the last uh, 36 hours or so, you may not have gotten the fact sheets and the links that I had sent out to those folks that I had sent out to yesterday. If you did not get that, email me at friend at illinois.edu and I will get that sent to you in the next day or so. So with that, I'm going to stop sharing and I'm going to turn it over to Jay Solomon. Jay is a uh, uh, extension educator in the Northwestern part of Illinois. And uh, he's gonna talk about how to, to maintain ponds. So welcome, Jay. Well, thank you for that. And I will see if I can get started. Um, and thanks to Blake for answering some of the, the questions in there um, uh, that were coming up. So. Let's see if I can make this work correctly. And are you seeing my come on, PowerPoint? Yes. All right. And I will at this point stop sharing my video to save us a little bit of bandwidth. Glad to be here and and uh, like Dwayne, uh, recognize I've got a lot of questions out there. What I hope to do is provide you with some of the some of the answers and maybe uh, some places to start looking for some of these things and, and thinking about where you might go with it. So I kind of looked at this from a pond management from a from a construction topics things that uh, uh, things that are important as you look at how the pond is built. And this comes from my background as an ag engineer. I just worked into that and it in been being a, a good way for me to approach some of this. So some of the things I want to talk a little bit about are thinking about the purpose of the pond, the size and depth we're looking at, where your inflow is coming out, where your outflow or and outflow and overflow management, which is an important piece of, of it, and some general protection things uh, as we as we go through here. So you know one of the things when we think about the purpose of the pond. Um, I often want to point out to people they really need to think of what's the priority piece in there and what are those other things the pond may be doing. And, you know, I hear that, oh, we've got a recreation pond, but, oh, you want to fish out of it or you want wildlife in it uh, or, you know, maybe in the case, uh, some livestock or irrigation being pulled some water out of that. Uh, fire protection can be an, an option in it as well. Um, and, and, Stormwater retention can be a part of that. There's no reason we can't have that multi-purpose part of it, but you do need to think about what are those things and what's important about it, because uh, it does have some ramifications both on how you manage it, maybe in, in, in general how you construct it, but then in how you also manage it going forward. So I wanted to, to start with kind of this picture of, of a pond that I am familiar with that happens to be uh, kind of a, the family gathering place. You see the picnic area at the far end of the pond there where the family gets together on a regular uh, evening basis. That's to the, to the west. So they're fishing out of it. We've got some duck nesting in there. We've got, as I say, picnic area, water retention. But this is also a livestock water system. And when we think about that, they're not having the livestock coming up to it, we're pulling water out of the bottom of the pond or out of, out of the pond and actually delivering it downstream. So we can tie all these different things together. Uh, and one of the points with what Dwayne was just talking about, some of your management, if you're trying to manage forward towards fish, maybe something we wanna do is, if livestock are currently have access to the pond, how do we still utilize the water out of that pond, but not allow them to have access to the to the pond itself. So some things about it from a fish standpoint, because that's the questions that as Dwayne and I, Dwayne indicated, that's the questions he and I tend to get the most of. Kind of prefer, preferable things, a minimum of a quarter acre or larger. 
Uh, and then some, some basic stuff that goes along with what Dwayne was talking about just a minute ago or previously, um, you want to maintain a minimum depth, depth with it. In other words, that minimum, maximum depth out, out in the middle of it, there needs to be a minimum depth there. In northern Illinois, we're looking at somewhere around 10 feet. That ensures that we've got some cold protection for those fish. It's not going to freeze all the way down. It gives that that uh, ability to have some of that uh, oxygen and, and water movement that Dwayne was talking about uh, and, and allows the fish to find that comfortable zone to be in, along with, uh, you know, we talked about during the winter, but also uh, in the heat of the summer, being able to get down and stay cool if they need to. You've got different fish out there. So, you know, there, that's kind of the thing to think about is uh, if you're looking at it, a deeper pond with our tendency to silt things in, you know, building a little deeper is definitely a, 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 an asset and, and greater depth gives that add, add to the life of it. But, um, you know, on older pond, ponds, one of the questions is, do you still have the depth? When we get people talking about having a lot of algae issues in it, a lot of plant growth in it, and having trouble keeping fish in it, quite often the question becomes, have you really checked to see what that pond was, how deep it is, uh, the characteristics about it? Because, uh, and I get into this one quite frequently, uh, well, that pond was built, you know, dad built it, or it was built 10 or 15, 20 years ago, or I bought it, and they really don't know how much that much about it. So that's one of the places you need to start is, what's our depth out there? Uh, and that may drive some of your decision making from, from that point on. From a, a depth standpoint, another key factor to remember from a, a weed management standpoint is a majority of it needs to be roughly five foot deep or deeper. And that's your, your standard standing water uh, depth of it. Uh, and that's from from weed control standpoint and also your temperature zones for the fish. Um, and we don't want to have a lot of extended area there that is that less than less than five feet and especially less than three feet, because that's where we get in a lot of cattails, other plants growing, a lot of aquatic uh, weed grow or you know, aquatic, aquatic plant growth starts in that area. So if you've got a lot of that going on, that may tell you a lot about what's going on with your pond. Uh, and you may need to, the, we may need to think about it and talk about uh, options with that. And I'll talk a little bit about, okay, if you've got problems with some of these, what might we be able to do towards the end of this presentation? So another piece of it to think about from the, from the pond standpoint is where's your inflow coming in, into it at? Um, you know, what's your drainage area out there? And kind of point this out from a standpoint of, if you're having water quality problems in it, there's a couple of places that you could have a problem with this. One is if you don't have enough drainage area, maybe that pond is drying down, you, you've got too much fluctuation in your water depth in there, and that's being a problem. Or if you've got too large of an area, you may have a lot of water going through the pond, um, you know, above that 20 to one max area. And we also have some concerns about, uh, maintaining the dam, make sure we don't overtop the dam uh, and that become an issue as well. Dwayne alluded to it a minute ago from reducing stand uh, sediment in your nutrient loads, thinking about how is the, the area up above or in that watershed, how's it being used? Um, is it cropland? Is there a chance to maybe put it into a pasture or uh, a, a grazing area? so that or, or a hay crop so that you can you don't have as many nutrients coming in you don't have as much uh soil coming into it um keeping ground cover on that all that ground is definitely a uh, an option now obviously that can't be the pond that i showed you just a minute ago primary part of the of the drainage area that was the field crop or the field crop field just above it uh but there were some things about how we dealt with the inflow um and one of the things back to this, if you've got more than more than that 20 to one area, can you divert some of the water around the pond so you're not having it go through the pond? You don't have that 
during a heavy rain, you don't have all that rush of silt coming in there and then settling out or, or hanging around and, and uh, causing causing basically the, the water to not be to be turbid. <coughs> Um, with the inflow, nutrient settlement uh, filtering, one of the things there is around the pool, around the pond, make sure that you've got that vegetative filter area somewhere around 100 feet wide. That, that helps filter that water coming into it and, and keep that vegetative. You don't have to be, keep it short. It doesn't need to be, a, it does not need to be and should not be a golf course, but go in and, and trim it off on a regular basis to keep it uh, Keep it vegetative. The upstream side of it, consider putting in some vegetative filtering, uh, a grass waterway, you know, maintaining your grass waterway. If you got silt problem coming in there and there's a waterway up there, start looking at it, what might be able, what might could be done with that? Um, you know, does it need some work done on it? A settling basin or a settling pond, as, as Dwayne pointed out in his picture, definitely something to think about. Uh, extends the life of the pond. That's an area that you let it dry down. You can dig the silt back out of it. You can keep reusing that and you're slowing that water down and giving it a chance, giving it a place for that, some of the sediment to fall out. Um, and it can be either an actual basin or just an area that's kind of flat and gives it, slows the water down in there uh, for, for a little while. I get that. Um, and then there's, and I think there's an open mic. On. There's an open mic somewhere. Um, on the out, on your outflow side, overflow management is the other important piece of this uh, to think about. Maintain that freeboard depth, your overflow spillway. Do you have a place to go with it? Make sure it's not plugged up. Maintenance of that is an important piece of it. And what's the emergency spillway? That is, you don't want water going over the center of the front of the of the dam if it's a if it's an earthen dam that's how you get we get failures out of it so just being aware of that so from a spillway standpoint you know in you want it installed designed to be roughly a we, we recommend a three foot uh freeboard in other words at three foot water starts overflowing it, it needs to be sized to match whatever you your inflow is coming into it and then looking at your emergency spillway auxiliary spillway or how you how it ramps up if you've got major major rainfall coming into the area and to give you a little bit of an area what i'm talking about this happens to be a, a small private pond that i was around it's a spring fed pond with a very low uh watershed ratio and so really is a little short on the freeboard but in this case you notice they always they have a this consistent oh about an inch to an inch and a half water flow out of it Rainfall of uh, through the through the spillway, rainfall event. You've got significant spillway there to take care of that and let the water out and you'll down the down down the stream. Here's a little more dramatic piece of it where you've got the the spillway is built in. Yes, it's in the middle of the dam, but we've got a, a concrete structure in there. Kind of the neat thing about it is you've got uh, a fish screen in that. And it's both the, uh, in this case, the major, the, the, the standard spillway, but it's also your emergency spillway because you've got plenty of freeboard in it to, to take the water out. Uh, unique thing about this particular pond as well, um, if you look to the, to the rougher grass back here uh, in, the, in the far side of the picture here, that's actually where they rerouted part of the watershed around it because it was much, had much bigger watershed than what the pond really needed. So actually set it up to divert part of the water around it. You know, some things about spillway. Um, you can do an earthen one. The key thing here I want to point out is if you do an earthen one, make sure you maintain it. It needs to be checked every once in a while. Should be level, uh, should be below your berm height, should have grass or, or rock across it to keep it from eroding. On smaller ponds, it may be a secondary pipe or your spillway, it may be all integrated in one where you've got a, a small or a fairly large pipe that uh, just increases the flow as, as water comes into it. 
but it's an important piece of not having uh, uh, the the pond pond failure, especially we getting these larger rainfall events. From a protection standpoint, you know one of the things again, maintaining grass around that exposed area. Uh, and one that was pointed out to me on this particular one, uh, where it had a lot of open area, wind drive, wind driven uh, water movement on the lake or on the pond itself towards the dam, was they went in and put riprap in it over some crushed rock to basically protect it from the the wave action, especially as it was getting established. This was a fairly new, uh, fairly new construction. So other pieces of it that we get into, I always get the questions about leaks. And, and so, um, you know, thinking about clearing your, your uh, brush, trees, that kind of stuff off and any animal damage you've got uh, in, in, there around the edges, uh, kind of keeping an eye on that, uh, on the dam. And as, as uh, Dwayne indicated, it's fine to have trees around the edge around on the edges of it, but also look at where they're at. I mean, right up on the edge, is it a possibility uh, close enough to area where it could be could be causing you some seeps? If you've got leaks, is it is it potential where you've got things being lost? Obviously talk about the controlling the pest and uh, muskrats, uh, beavers. There's some recommendations. Um, and I think some of the Purdue stuff, the Purdue items that, uh, Dwayne shared along with, uh, I think one of the fact sheets we've got talks a little bit about this. And if you're removing them, you've got to remove all of them and you need to go back in and really discourage them from going back in. Uh, even if you have one animal get loot, get a, away and stay in the area, it will try to reopen that den. That den. So you, some large rocks, screen wire, that kind of stuff to, to really discourage the, if you've got a problem with that. And if you've got, if you're losing water, one of the places to, to start is look downstream of the, of the dam. Is there, is there seeps? Is there water showing up down below that's not related to your spillway uh, or your overflow? Um, those are indications that you've got water moving underground and, and to where you're, uh, to where that that's at and, and then you see that occasionally and that's an indication that we may have uh, a major leak uh, a major uh, uh, connection to a uh, a zone in there they'll, they'll conduct that water through and need to look at how we how we're going to fix that problem it can be an indication that we need to do some major work on on a pond to, to really seal it up so one of the things along that lines that i, I learned by learned from a, a, a pond that I was involved with was we noticed that whenever it filled up to a certain point, that's when it would start leaking back down. It fell up to the spillway, it run out of the spillway for a little while, and then it dropped down to about a foot below the spillway. Got to looking at it and realized that they'd done a really nice job of building the pond, really done a good job of packing the clay into the bottom of it, but they had either cut a little short up on the inlet side or the erosion had got it back down to the bedrock and down to the sediment layer where basically that was one of those cases where got back down to the sediment layer, we had water going, being conducted under the pond and out the front of the pond. Uh, and they were able to drain it down and, and do a little bit of, of letting it drain down a little ways, do a little bit of work and compact it the, some, some additional clay into it, uh, a little bit of strategically placed bentonite and actually packed it in there and seal it back up and, and gain that other foot or two foot of water that they were hoping to get out of it. So those are the kind of things that you're looking for in that. We often hear that, oh, it's got a lake, add bentonite to it. You can't just uh, arbitrarily throw some bentonite in there and go, oh, it's going to, it's going to seal it up, seal it up. You kind of need to know where that's at, where your leak's at and, and try to work it in and get it, get it to settle in. Otherwise you've got to have a whole lot of it. And in doing that, you're going to create a fish kill because of all the sediment in it until the clay settles down. 
So it, it is the cure, but it's not just a open a bag and pour it out there and you'll cure the problem, cure. Um, which brings me to the last piece of this to think about. If you've got some of these problems that we've talked about here, I pointed out to them, is it time to think about re renovating that pond? Doesn't mean you have to tear it all out and start over again, but maybe we drain it down uh, and, and do either pack some clay into it, dig it out a little, dig the sediment back out of it, um, just kind of rework it. And some of the issues can be weed issues around the edge. If you've got a lot of weeds, a lot of, of cattails going right there along the edge, means that edge has got quite a bit of it that's only two or three foot, you know, that three to five foot deep at max. Um, if you've got spillway issues, you know, is it, is the seal gone around that uh, or uh, it's insufficient as things have changed over time, need a bigger, bigger pipe through it. Those can be another a part of it that you may can drain it down and do, maybe not completely empty it, but do some work on, on it and redo it. And obviously the leaking is a, a big part of it. So, you know, kind of in summary, think about what your main purposes are. What else do you want to do with it? You know, if you've got a pond out there and you are thinking about uh, changing it over and, and doing fish out of it, but still need the livestock in it, you may drain it down a little ways, create a, 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 a dry, dry well uh, where we can put a pump into it or where we can put uh, uh, a line in and around the dam and, and pull water out of, out of the bottom of it. It's a good way to do that. Look into that minimum of a quarter acre if you're looking at a fish pond uh, and, and somewhere around 10 feet deep uh, as, as a minimum. You kind of look at your, what's your ratio? Is that, does that tell you a little bit about what maybe is going on with it? Um, obviously sediment management and then just in the general protecting the, protecting the dam so you don't have failure with it uh, and unexpectedly. And there are some additional resources, and I can get you the links to these if you're interested in this is this is resources we look at from a construction standpoint. Um, and at that, I will ask if there's any questions that I need to answer. If not, uh, we'll probably move on towards the other end of it and uh, let uh, our other speaker, let Blake talk here. So I will stop sharing and Turn it back to Dwayne. Okay, thank you, Jay. And our next speaker is Blake Rubush. Blake is a Illinois Department of Natural Resources fisheries biologist covering uh, multiple counties in the west central part of the state. And he's going to uh, finish up with our presentations tonight and then we will move on to questions after that. So Blake, it is all yours. All right, give me one second here. All right, can you see my screen, Dwayne? Yes, we can. All right, thanks everybody. Uh, my name is Blake Rubush. I'm a district fisheries biologist with the Illinois Department of Natural Resources. Uh, thank you, Dwayne and Jay, for uh, presenting the first two portions of tonight's uh, webinar. Um, also online, some of you may have noticed, uh, I've got one of my colleagues, uh, here this evening. His name is David Wiffles, and he's a district fisheries biologist in Northwest Illinois. And uh, he's been helping out answering a few questions. Um, so just to give you a quick overview of what we do as DNR fisheries biologists, um, our main purpose is to manage fish and aquatic plant populations in public lakes. I currently cover 10 counties. Um, my biggest lake is Lake Jacksonville in Morgan County and um, ranges from anywhere from a quarter acre public pond up to 500 acre uh, Lake Jacksonville. Um, I mostly cover counties in West Central Illinois and then work with biologists that are adjacent to me. Uh, 
for our work. We do fish surveys on public waters. We do vegetation treatments to try to improve fishing and boater access. Uh, we raise fish, we coordinate stocking fish through our hatchery, and we do habitat improvements. Uh, one of our really big uh, uh, job duties this time of year is providing consultation to private pond owners in uh, you know, webinars, um, in-person type of seminars, and then uh, a lot of on the phone and email type of consultation. Um, other things that we do, we prevent, uh, present outreach programs to uh, student groups and other interest groups. We work with the Illinois EPA on contaminant testing, and then we work on our rivers and streams with our, our biologists that cover uh, those types of water bodies. So we've talked about the pond itself. We've talked about aeration. We've talked about the watershed. Um, there's no need for me to cover those topics. Um, but in general, uh, to have suitable habitat for fish and aquatic life, we need to have a pond that is, in my opinion, an acre or greater. Uh, the pond shape, depth, water quality are all important factors. And not all ponds are suitable for game fish. Uh, some ponds may be suitable for other species, but perhaps they're not suitable for bass, bluegill, channel catfish, etc. cetera. Um, issues with smaller ponds include the fish population being out of balance, excessive aquatic plants, susceptibility to summer and winter kill, and then of course, uh, in the event of a drought, a pond could uh, potentially dry up. So we talked about some plants a little bit, uh, talked about photosynthesis, and um, just like on land, organic matter and minerals plus sunlight uh, create plant growth. So in a pond situation, we're referring to plankton and aquatic plant growth. Plankton growth is important for all fish, especially during the early stages of their life. And uh, then other plant types provide food to crayfish and aquatic insects. And those organisms then provide food to bluegill, red ear, young of year, largemouth bass, channel catfish. And then ultimately small fish provide food to large fish and large fish create a happy fisherman or a fisherwoman. So this time of year, we get a lot of calls about fish stocking. Um, first of all, what are your objectives? What do you want to do with your pond? Uh, depending on what you have, um, as far as the uh, size of your pond, history of your pond, uh, that's going to determine what's feasible as far as meeting your objectives. Uh, we need to know the, the type of pond, uh, what's, what's the size, how many acres, how deep is it? Can you tell us anything about the water chemistry? Um, how fertile is your pond? Is your, is your pond uh, located in the timber? Is it located in uh, an agricultural tillable field uh, type of setting? Uh, perhaps you have a septic field or some livestock nearby that uh, creates fertility and makes the pond uh, better at growing plants. Uh, what's the existing fish population? Uh, what's the fishing pressure and harvest look like? And then ultimately, what do you want? Uh, it's your pond. Uh, some people like to make their pond look like a swimming pool. Some people like to see a diversity of plants and wildlife. There's different objectives. So here's the, the bluegill. This is the Illinois state fish. It's found in virtually every body of water in the state. Uh, it's one of the most important prey species for largemouth bass. They primarily feed on aquatic insects. Uh, they feed on plankton and uh, zooplankton in earlier stages of their life. And they're very important as the forage base in your, your farm pond or lake. Another sunfish species, uh, not to be confused with a hybrid sunfish. Uh, this is the red ear sunfish. It is its own species and is popular in uh, private ponds. It is also called the shell cracker. It's known for eating snails and other mollusks, and uh, they're a good addition to your pond. They don't reproduce as, uh, as uh, well as bluegill, 
So they're not going to provide as good a forage for your bass. So it's important to do a combination of stocking of bluegill and red ear if you wish to have red ear. They also help um, interrupt the, the life cycle of a couple different parasites that we see in fish. The yellow grub and the black spot are two parasites that are commonly found in fish flesh when people are flaying fish. And that life cycle can be broken by removing snails from a pond. So we typically suggest that people stock red ear sunfish. Here's the largemouth bass. The largemouth bass is a top predator. And um, they are the species that's going to control the fish population uh, from there on down. So it's important to maintain a good predator population. Uh, some folks may have goals to uh, create a trophy bass fishery. Other people may uh, prefer to have a panfish or a sunfish uh, fishery. So balancing the number of predators will help you reach that goal. We can talk more about that uh, here in a couple slides. Uh, largemouth bass are found statewide and um, very popular sport fish uh, for, for eating, uh, for rod and reel fishing as a sport. A lot of tournament fishing goes on uh, targeting this particular species. Now we move on to a fish that uh, does not have scales. They have skin, uh, the channel catfish. It's a member of the catfish family. Uh, this is one of, this is the only uh, channel catfish, or excuse me, catfish species that we would recommend uh, stocking in private ponds. Uh, bullheads and flathead catfish are generally non-desirable to have in a pond. Um, the channel catfish will forage on a variety of food types including fish. Uh, as they get larger, they will eat a few fish. They like to eat aquatic plants, aquatic insects, um, even organic matter uh, that's decaying at the pond bottom. Uh, they rely on their sense of smell um, and not so much their, uh, their vision, whereas the previous species, the bluegill, red ear sunfish, and largemouth bass primarily use their sight to find food. This is a fathead minnow. This is a popular uh, forage species that can be stocked in a new pond to give largemouth bass a jump start into their first season. Um, fathead minnows can be supplementally stocked later on after your pond is established. However, in my opinion, and I think you'll get the same opinion from, from most of our DNR fisheries biologists, uh, stocking minnows or golden shiners after a pond is established it's kind of like giving your fish a treat. Um, it's not going to yield noticeable results in your, your bass, and you're probably not going to really make a huge difference. They're just going to eat them up right away, and um, it'll just be like throwing a bag of potato chips in the pond. They'll, they'll be gone in no time. Here's a few different sport fish species that we don't recommend in small ponds. Uh, smallmouth bass, it's more of a river species. It does better in, uh, in rocky habitat and free-flowing streams. The muskie, muskie is a large predator. We typically stock those at one fish per acre in our public lakes, and uh, most ponds are not going to be able to support a very large muskie fishery. Uh, northern pike, northern pike are uh, similar to the muskie in that we wouldn't stock very many per acre. Uh, it's typically not one that we would we would suggest for a, a private pond that's say one to five acres. Um, if you own a property that has a pond that's say 10 to 20 acres and you want to diversify, the uh, best thing you can do is talk to your district fisheries biologist and then get recommendations from there. Uh, walleye, another species, uh, we typically don't stock them at a very high rate in smaller waters, probably not one that you would want to choose. Uh, sauger. Sauger is more of a, a river species. It's a cousin to the walleye and uh, they just do better in muddier uh, river conditions. Same for the flathead catfish, river species, a very large predator. Uh, flathead catfish can actually disrupt the balance of your fish population in a small pond quite easily. Um, hybrid striped bass, they prefer to eat on on uh, gizzard shad, which we typically don't recommend to stock in a private pond, uh, simply because they're going to compete with your sunfish and you're going to lose that sunfish quality by having gizzard shad present. 
Um, and then the crappies. Uh, crappies are very popular in ponds. However, it's kind of risky business stocking either species in a private pond. Uh, first of all, both of them are highly prolific. Uh, one crappie can lay anywhere or can lay up to 20,000 eggs in one nest. Um, they spawn prior to largemouth bass and bluegill. And if uh, bass are our top predator, we don't want to have a species spawning prior to the bass, uh, simply because we want those little baby bass to get a good start and then recruit into the population and grow to an adult size. So by stocking crappie, you're potentially taking away from food that those baby bass otherwise would have had, um, and that would have given them a jump start before the bluegills start to spawn. Um, ultimately, as crappies get older, they're going to compete for other food resources. They're going to compete for space, um, spawning habitat, uh, just space in general. And uh, because they are so prolific and, and because of some of these characteristics, uh, being able to compete with bass and bluegill, they can easily stunt out in a pond and create an undesirable fishery uh, with really, you know, a high number of small fish that aren't going to amount to anything as far as uh, meat production. Some other undesirable species include common carp. They make the water muddy. Bullheads, very prolific, aggressive, make the water muddy. Yellow bass. They don't grow to a very large size. They have a large mouth. Uh, they will feed on other sport fish, eggs, and uh, baby fish, and can really be undesirable. I mentioned gizzard shad. Gizzard shad can uh, convert uh, plankton and uh, create algal blooms uh, just through their waste. Uh, they also uh, compete with your sunfish. So you're gonna lose out on your sunfish quality if you stock gizzard shad. And then the green sunfish, uh, it's a cousin to the bluegill and the red ear sunfish. However, it doesn't get to a very desirable size and it's very aggressive um, and very reproductive. So you can see with a lot of these undesirable species, they have similar characteristics. Uh, they can either change water quality or they can uh, essentially overtake a pond and have very aggressive habits. So what's the central Illinois recipe? Uh, we suggest that you stock largemouth bass, channel catfish, bluegill, and uh, red ear sunfish. These species are popular among fishermen. They are biologically adapted to a wide variety of conditions throughout the state of Illinois. They can uh, use natural and artificial foods, and they're compatible with most of the species that could be stocked later. So if you were to stock a, a new pond, uh, here are some numbers on uh, stocking a, a brand new pond here, you know, this spring 2021. Uh, you could start out with your channel catfish, bluegill, um, or you could do a channel catfish and a combination of bluegill and red ear sunfish. And then you could stock some fathead minnows to get your bass a jump start uh, in the fall of 2021. Um, and we can go into this a little more if there's questions. Um, this video, of course, will be recorded so people can uh, reference some of these slides with the particular numbers. Um, in some cases, in an established pond, you may need to do a corrective or supplemental stocking. Uh, perhaps you had a bass kill. Uh, you lost bass in a summer or winter kill. You may need to stock some five to eight inch largemouth bass to try to get that population back in balance. Um, channel catfish, they tend to not recruit to an adult size in small ponds. Uh, this is because one, the water is very clear. Your sight feeders, such as your bass, bluegill, uh, they will feed on the catfish eggs and uh, larval fish. And generally in small ponds, catfish spawning habit or habitat is not present. Catfish like to spawn in old muskrat dens, hollowed out logs, other types of cavities, and those uh, types of habitat are generally not present in small ponds. Uh, perhaps you have an overabundance of bluegill. How do you handle that situation? You can harvest more bluegill. Uh, that'll help improve the quality of the fish that remain. Maybe you need to stock more largemouth bass. Uh, try to get some more predators in there. 
conducting a drawdown is another option if you have that ability to drain your pond down a little bit. Consolidate those small fish with bass and the bass will uh, be able to feed on them more easily and it will reduce the number of bluegill. And then other uh, management actions could include reducing the number of places for small fish to hide. Perhaps you have a lot of aquatic plants or you have a lot of woody debris. If you can remove some of that material, treat the aquatic plants, you can improve the bluegill population. Uh, fish harvest is very important. Harvest is, is uh, something that's critical for a pond and many private ponds are underutilized. Uh, it's an important management tool. Um, if you are uh, starting out with a new pond or relatively new pond, uh, you can start harvesting bluegill in year two, bass in year three, your channel catfish, you're gonna have to stock those from year to year. Uh, so you can basically just stock catfish and take them out as desired. Um, the biggest thing on any of this, even on the topics that Dwayne and Jay covered, uh, consult with your district fisheries biologist. That's the first place to start. Um, you know, you're going to be able to, to learn a lot very quickly and hopefully save some money uh, simply by talking to us and, uh, you know, just picking our brain for a little bit. Uh, if you wish to buy fish, you can buy from a few dis different sources. Uh, you can buy fish through the, uh, uh, you can look at our list online. It's a private fish dealer list on ifishillinois.org, or you can uh, reach out to your county soil and water conservation district. Every county has one. Uh, they oftentimes have fish sales. Um, you can also go to your local farm or feed store, Farm and Home Supply, Buckites, Farm King, etc. They oftentimes have spring and fall fish sales. Um, if you have, say you have a larger body of water and you're looking to have fish brought in, uh, perhaps you need to um, actually work with a fish farmer to get permits to do that. Uh, we have people that can help you with those types of permits. Uh, I won't go into that in too much detail. Uh, we talked about winter kill uh, during Dwayne's talk. Uh, winter kill basically just happens when uh, oxygen has been depleted from a pond. So uh, this typically happens when we have a, a long duration of ice covered with snow. And anytime you have a shallow pond that's very fertile, you're more susceptible to having a winter kill. Summer kill, uh, it's a time uh, just a, when natural die-offs occur, aquatic plants could die off. Uh, compare it to your lawn. When your cool season grasses die in the summer, um, all of a sudden it turns brown. Same thing can happen at a pond, depending on the plant community. When those plants die, they decompose, use up a lot of oxygen, and fish can stress and die. Uh, we can see summer water temperatures up to 90, 95 degrees, uh, and this can be a very stressful time for fish, and they can um, stress out and die. There are solutions. Uh, deep in your pond, uh, ponds that are 7 to 10 foot deep, um, maximum depth, they can still have fish kills, so the deeper the better. Um, control your aquatic plants. And then, of course, as Dwayne mentioned, you can look at some aeration options. There's other causes of mortality, organic pollution, um, just organic material over time, pesticides. Uh, it's not, not as common as, as folks think, but it certainly is possible. Um, runoff. Uh, maybe you live in an urban area and there's runoff from the, the streets that enters a, a body of water. Um, just the just natural mortality, you know, fish get old and die. If, if fish are not harvested, then they're going to get old and die eventually. So uh, it, it just happens. It's, it's nature. And then there's runoff and, uh, you know, industrial mining type situations. Um, so we talked about why aquatic plants are important. They produce oxygen, uh, improves diversity in the pond, provides places for fish to hide. Uh, in some cases, it can be pleasing uh, to look at. In other cases, it's not. It can hinder fishing, boating, swimming, etc. There's four different types of, uh, excuse me, there's five different types uh, that we can talk about here. Emergent plants would include your cattails, your, your shoreline plants, uh, rooted floating plants might include white water lilies, 
uh, free floating plants, uh, duckweed, water meal, uh, mat forming algae would be like the filamentous algae, and uh, submerged plants, coontail, pondweeds, naiads, etc. Uh, if you're looking to stock any of these types of plants, uh, reach out to me later, but we have an aquatic life approved species list with plants that are native and uh, allowed to be planted um, in Illinois. Uh, the last thing we want you to do is introduce a new exotic plant and introduce it to the state. Um, here's a picture of some filamentous algae. I'm sure many of you have seen this. Uh, it comes on this time of year. I'm going to go through these pretty quick. I'm going to look forward on time here. Um, blue green algae. Uh, it's very common in the hot, stagnant part of the summer. It's uh, very similar looking to like a spilled uh, oil based paint on the surface of the water. Uh, it's it's a, a good idea to keep your pets out of the water. You know, don't swim in the water if you see this. Um, it's not necessarily useful. I think. Uh, got somebody that keeps turning their microphone on. Um, so, you know, be mindful that uh, blue-green algae can be uh, somewhat harmful if ingested. I mean, you're probably just going to get sick, but, uh, you know, if the water doesn't look pleasant to swim in, then probably just wouldn't swim in it. Uh, here's some other floating plants, some duckweed and water meal. Uh, these are really common in ponds that have had livestock in them. These ponds have had cattle and horses in them. You can see all the, the gates around. Uh, these are really shallow fertile ponds. Here's some of your emergent plants. You got the cattails on the, the left, arrowhead on the right. Um, both can be really nice plants to have, uh, but at times they can be a bit of a nuisance too. Here's some submerged plants. Uh, this one in particular is very popular uh, or common around the state. This is the coontail. And um, you can see in the picture on the left, it's, it's almost overtaking this pond. Some uh, other nice plants, uh, American pondweed. This is one that I really like. Uh, it's a nice looking plant. Um, it's a rooted plant. Um, on the right, we've got some other pondweed species. Um, naiads and pondweeds oftentimes look very similar. Um, so all of those aquatic plants are important for uh, habitat and oxygen production. Uh, but, but there's other ways you can provide habitat. You can create artificial uh, PVC uh, type of structures. Uh, these on the left went in Sankris Lake over in uh, Christian County. Uh, you can make habitat projects out of concrete and old lumber. Uh, these are some stick up projects that we put in Pittsfield City Lake a couple of years ago. Um, as far as aquatic plant management goes, um, you know, there's, there's different options. One is mechanical control. Uh, I looked up this machine before the presentation. I think it's like $85,000 to buy this machine. Probably not practical for your private pond. However, the cheaper option is probably not practical either. Uh, if you're going to use a garden rake, uh, you're going to be in for a lot of work. Um, grass carp are a common uh, option. People use grass carp uh, to, to control submerged aquatic plants. They're cheap. Um, they, they do feed on some vegetation types. Uh, they really don't prefer to eat duckweed, cattails, or uh, creeping water primrose or even filamentous algae. So they're not always the best option uh, for your aquatic plant problem. So if you do wish to stock grass carp, the best thing you can do is call your district fisheries biologist. Figure out what plant types you're dealing with and then come up with a plan with them. Uh, this stocking rate chart is just a general guideline. But again, your district biologist can tell you if grass carp are even going to work in your particular case. Uh, I know there's a question about water dyes. Uh, water dyes are a good alternative to some herbicides, especially for submerged aquatic plant issues. Uh, make sure you apply them early in the season. Don't do it in the middle of the summer. If you shut the lights out and apply a heavy dose of, of aqua shade in the middle of the summer, you are essentially going to turn off the lights and your plants are going to start to die and break down. 
you're going to trigger a fish kill. I've seen it happen. Uh, so make sure and get that application uh, schedule started. April, May, continue through summer. Uh, there's a lot of different chemical control options. Um, again, contact your district fisheries biologist. That's going to be your best bet uh, for a successful treatment and the best way to save money. Uh, you don't want to put a chemical on that's not going to treat the issue that you're dealing with. There's uh, copper products that are primarily used for algae issues. Um, you know, there's a lot of different options, copper sulfate, Qtrin Plus, Cleargate, et cetera. Um, again, your district fisheries biologist can help you pick the one that is best for your particular uh, issue. Uh, these products can be sprayed on. Uh, you, can, uh, you can drag them, you can scatter them uh, through different application methods. Um, so certainly different options there. I'll try to get through these. I know we're getting a little bit close on time here. Uh, we got a few more slides. Um, diquat dibromide. I know it was mentioned in the in the chat earlier. Uh, there's a couple different uh, products out there, um, and it, it's really good on submerged aquatic plants. Um, it can control duckweed and water meal, but it's a contact killer. So if you don't hit every plant, then you're not necessarily going to have 100 kill. Um, I use this a lot on our public waters, and uh, it's very effective. There's 2,4-D products out there. Uh, they're good on some of the emergent and some submerged aquatic plants. Um, just depends on what you're dealing with. Glyphosate. Uh, glyphosate is the main ingredient in Roundup. However, Roundup is not labeled for aquatic use. Uh, so I suggest that you uh, look at using a product such as Rodeo, Aquapro, Aquanet, uh, Farm and Home Supply Cells, Shore Clear. Uh, they're all different uh, brand names of uh, glyphosate that is labeled for aquatic use and safe to use in an aquatic environment. Um, this can be used on cattails um, and along shorelines of ponds. Fluoridone. Fluoridone is a systemic herbicide. Uh, a couple of brand names include Sonar, Avast, Spritflow, etc. Uh, these are, are very effective products. Uh, they're best to use in a situation where you don't have a lot of water passing over your overflow. You want it to stay in your pond for 30 to 45 days. And uh, this herbicide is a systemic, meaning that it, it actually um, will take a, a fair amount of time to, um, to kill the plant and uh, be effective. It is costly though, uh, very costly. Here's an example of a fluoridone treatment we did at Washington Park Pond in Sangamon County, middle of Springfield. Uh, we treated it with fluoridone and some diquat dibromide uh, to try to get this duckweed cleaned up before kids fishing clinics. And this is on June 6, 2018. June 20th, 2018, we really cleared it up nice. Now keep in mind, we use that diquat as a contact killer, and then we use the fluoridone as a uh, kind of a maintenance uh, herbicide moving forward. Um, there are requirements for water uh, applications of herbicides. Um, if you'd like to learn more, you can find out more on the EPA website. Uh, it's basically just a, a notice of intent that you submit uh, stating what herbicides you plan to use, how much and where. And this requirement is administered by the Illinois uh, Environmental Protection Agency. Uh, here's a kind of a miscellaneous pond topic. If you have muddy water, uh, it could be caused by a couple different things. One, it can be caused by common carp or bullheads, uh, just stirring up the sediment on the bottom. Uh, perhaps your watershed is too large. You have too much water passing through your pond. It's bringing in a lot of sediment. Uh, maybe you have soil erosion uh, from the adjacent field. Uh, you could also have clay suspensions. Uh, there could be uh, little uh, clay particles that are uh, charged up and actually bouncing off of each other repeatedly. 
and uh, they can stay suspended in the water. Uh, so if you have that issue, uh, we can talk more about that if there's any questions, uh, but there are ways to try to, to clear a pond up that has that clay uh, particle issue. Um, if you would like to find more information about pond management in Illinois, I would suggest uh, checking out our Illinois DNR uh, webpage. We have some really good resources. Um, I would say we could probably compete with Purdue. Um, we've got our pond management book, uh, stocking rates, um, pond issues, corrective stocking, uh, fish ID, things of that nature, um, aquatic plants. Uh, these books are, are, have been around for a number of years and have a lot of good material, uh, herbicide application suggestions, things of that nature. Um, so with that, I think I've definitely gone over on my time slot, but uh, if there's any questions for me, uh, you can reach out to me. I would like to point out that I just cover 10 counties in Illinois. So uh, if I'm not in one of, if, I, if I'm not uh, covering your county, uh, it'd be a great idea for you to reach out to your district fisheries biologist for your respective county, uh, simply because uh, they're going to be more familiar with what's going on in your neck of the woods. And um, I'm happy to help out with any questions you have, but would like to keep your district biologist in the loop as far as what's going on too. Um, so with that, I think I will conclude my portion. Um, here's the district fisheries biologist by county page, uh, which we can share in the chat too. So Dwayne, I will go ahead and stop for questions and, and I can stay on later if I need to for, for uh, more questions if necessary. Okay, well, and we'll probably we'll probably cut it off at 830, but I think a lot of the questions have already been answered. I'm going to try to go through and find ones that maybe haven't had an uh, exact answer yet, and we'll, we'll get through what we can. So one of the first ones I see, uh, is it a bad idea to run an aerator through winter? Uh, no, no, in my opinion, it's not. Um nothing wrong with running an aerator in the winter. One thing to be mindful of is depending on where you live, um, you, you may attract geese. And if geese are abundant, then uh, you, know, you could have an influx of unwanted waste added to your pond. So that, that just depends on where you live. Um, Let's see, somebody asked, will it harm turtles or frogs as far as running the aerator? Uh, I, don't, I don't have any reason to think that it would, um, but I, I could be wrong. I'm not a herpetologist, so I, I'm not certain on that, but um, I know people run aerators in the winter and um, chances are they probably still have frogs and turtles in their pond. So um, not 100% sure if it would actually harm uh, frogs and turtles. Okay. Um, another one I see, I'm not sure it's, if it's already been answered, but is there a product that works better than reward for controlling creeping primrose? Uh, creeping water primrose. Yep. That, I saw that one. Um, it can be treated with glyphosate products. Uh, so rodeo, aquanite, shore clear. Uh, those are all options. And uh, you would just use one to two ounces of product per gallon and that uh, that glyphosate can be sprayed on top. Um, it would be helpful to use a surfactant. Uh, you can get surfactants um, online. Um, if Dave's still on, he may have a, yeah, he just said an aquatic approved surfactant. So whatever surfactant you end up choosing, just make sure that it's labeled for aquatic use. Okay, here's one that I think it might, this might go to Jay. Jay, how do you dig out an existing pond without digging out the original base? And that's a, that's a pretty good trick and, and goes along with a, a question here that was in there about uh, dealing with sediment in an older pond. Uh, really comes down to a couple of things. What do you know about the pond to start with? In other words, can you dig back, if it's got sediment in it, and you know what your depth originally was, is digging back down to that original level. Uh, it's also why we talk about on doing uh, 
renovation of a pond, a lot of times the best thing to do is pull the water completely out of it and, and, and do the dig down and repack it back in. Assuming there's a pretty good chance you're going to get down to that, that layer uh, and down into the original base of it. Um, the other part of that is if you've got somebody who's got quite a bit of experience uh, running, running equipment, especially like dipping out around the edges, who's got uh, quite a bit of experience working around ponds, they may be able to look at that and know, know what their limits of how far they can go in to, to, to dip out and, and how much is where they're dipping out just the sediment and not digging into that clay layer to start with. But it is a, it is a, it's a fine detail that has to be done. And on an older pond, about the only thing, if you get, if it's full of sediment, about the only thing you can do is, is, is drain the pond down or, or drain part of the pond down and, and actually go in and dip some of it out, unfortunately, or, or bring in a, a, a dredge and, and do it from the surface, which is a nice way to do it, but an expensive way to do it. I think some contractors would tell you too, Jay, that building a new pond is a comparable cost to dredging or cleaning out an existing pond. Um, so if I have a landowner that's interested in cleaning out an old pond, then we also talk about other sites on their property, if any, where they could potentially build a new pond and then they can kind of weigh the, the, uh, you know, the two options. Right, and, and I, would, I would completely agree with that. And, and several times I've seen where they essentially incorporated the existing pond into a, a bigger, newer pond as well as a way to deal with it. Yeah, just moving downstream in the, in the watershed uh, yeah. and using that old pond for a sediment trap. That's a, a good option too. Yeah, and especially when you talk about some of these older, pretty small ponds, that's definitely a, a good place to look at it. Okay, another one, and this one kind of dovetails into what you just talked about. Uh, got a pond about three acres, maximum depth 20 feet, three quarters surrounded by trees. These, there are several questions here. The first one is, how can they best control sediment? Uh, second one is how to control algae. And then the third is what volume of aeration would be needed for that size? So whoever wants to answer that one, go for it. Sure. Um, so if you have three quarters of the pond surrounded by timber, then you're going to have a lot of leaf litter that's entering the pond. And if they're oak and hickory leaves, then they're going to create uh, kind of a brown tint in the water. Uh, that's the tannins from those uh, two species groups. And uh, oak and hickory leaves can actually uh, contribute to lower oxygen situations uh, just because the, that leaf material is a little bit harder to break down than some of the other species. Um, and when you have organic matter, whether it's leaves or, or other nutrients entering the pond, uh, you're going to have aquatic plant issues such as filamentous algae. Um, so aeration would probably be a good idea in this situation. Um, there are uh, companies out there that can, can quantify how much aeration is needed for a pond uh, based on the acreage and the uh, average depth. Um, there's uh, certainly different herbicides, algicides that could be used uh, to treat aquatic plants uh, for filamentous algae. Any of the copper products are a good option. Um, I didn't put anything in my slides, but there are beneficial bacterias that are on the market. And if you use those in combination with aeration, then uh, I have seen where people have had some success at reducing organic matter and nutrients, and then in turn, they end up with less plant issues. Um, we've actually used some of those products on our state fairgrounds ponds at the headquarters, and we have an aeration system. We've applied uh, beneficial bacteria product, um, just little encapsulated uh, beneficial bacteria pods, and we've seen a uh, reduction in plant growth uh, because of that management activity. Um, so 
it'd be good to reach out to your district fisheries biologist and talk about your specific pond. And then, you know, they might be able to help you come up with a more refined plan. Okay, next question is, uh, how can best control threat from otters and mink? The best way to, to keep otters, mink, muskrats under control in your pond is to either A, uh, trap them. Uh, if you have a trapping license, uh, do it during the trapping season. Uh, for those particular species, uh, it runs from November through mid-February. Um, another option is to allow another licensed trapper to come in and, and help uh, you know, eliminate those species. Uh, the trapper can benefit from uh, selling the pelts and the uh, animal doesn't necessarily go to waste. Uh, there are nuisance trapping permits that uh, are occasionally issued. Uh, those are handled by wildlife biologists within the Illinois DNR. Um, in a pond, say a pond where you have um, American lotus, you're going to attract muskrats. They really like to eat American lotus. So in that situation, uh, get rid of the plant that they like to eat. Um, as far as otters go, otters are going to be the ones that are eating your large catfish or other uh, large fish in the in the colder months, um, there's not really a way to deter them uh, without catching them and removing them. So um, while an otter may enter your pond and eat a few fish, uh, they may eat a lot of fish, but if your pond's you know, two acres or more, chances are they're not eating enough to, to totally ruin it. Uh, every situation is different, but um, in most ponds, they're probably doing a little bit of good in your larger ponds. If you've got a half acre or one acre pond and a family of otters enters your pond, chances are they could eat all of your large catfish. Uh, so again, it's a good idea to talk to your district fisheries biologist, uh, your district wildlife biologist, uh, local trappers, and try to come up with a plan uh, in one of those ways. One of the on, the, on the otter question itself, one of the things I ran across in looking was uh, they tend to prefer to use somebody else's den so old old den so when you took if you've had a muskrat problem going in and make sure you collapse that den and there's a good way one way to invite them not to hang around yep that's a good idea uh, they like to use beaver dens too old beaver lodges and beaver bank dens uh, so if you have a way to you know try to to uh, remove the beaver lodge or uh, mm -hmm work on your banks to try to reduce any beaver den, uh, remnant beaver dens, uh, that would be an option too. It might be kind of challenging to deal with those bank dens, but uh, a beaver lodge you may be able to, to remove if it's close enough to the bank. Um, and again, you need to work with your district wildlife biologist just to make sure you're in, in compliance with wildlife rules and things of that nature. Right. Okay, we're gonna to try to go through a, a few more. We're getting quite a few. And uh, the thing that we'll try to do is, since this is being recorded and the um, chat is also being recorded, what we don't get to, uh, we'll try to address uh, at another point. But we'll, we'll go through a few more here. Uh, will grass carp eat coontail? Yes, grass carp love coontail. Um, Problem is the coontail is very aggressive at growing. Um, so you'll, you'll have to stock grass carp at a little bit higher density. And one thing to keep in mind, anytime you remove any plant type, the nutrient source is likely still there. So if you overstock grass carp to control coontail, then the grass carp are likely going to convert that coontail into fish waste. And you're gonna go from having very clear water with dense aquatic plants to having very green water uh, full of planktonic algae. Uh, so there's kind of a trade-off. Uh, we typically don't suggest stocking more than 10 grass carp per acre. That's the highest rate. Um, so it'd be good to talk to your district biologist, get their opinion on uh, stocking grass carp. And you may wanna consider some other herbicides as well. Okay, another one, how are, crop, how are copper products with regard to fish safety? Um, most copper products are, are, well, all copper products are safe to use at some level. 
Uh, you need to stay within the, the restrictions of the label. Um, copper sulfate, if used repeatedly, can uh, get trapped in the sediment and it can negatively affect uh, fish eggs. Um, and I'm talking like years and years of application. Um, a buffered uh, copper alternative, uh, chelated copper is Qtrain Plus, and that's a good, uh, good alternative. Um, and I'm not saying cop copper sulfate is bad. It just, if you repeatedly use it over and over, it could be detrimental to fish eggs. Um, a Qtrain Plus is a good option. Uh, it can be sprayed on. There's liquid forms available. There's granular forms available, and th those would likely uh, not have the same effects over time uh, if used uh, every year. I'm just looking through here. It looks like uh, David's doing a really good job of keeping up with the. Yeah, I, I called Dave before the presentation, and uh, we kind of did this on a pond management talk that he gave a few weeks ago. I tried to answer questions while he was talking, so. Uh, thank you, Dave, for helping that out. And for those of you that are in Northwest Illinois, David Wiffles is a, a great contact. Um, he covers a number of counties up there. You can find his, his phone number on our, our web page on that district fisheries biologist page. Uh, we're we're going to take two more questions and then we're going to we're going to call it for the evening. How many trees per acre per pond or how many trees per acre in pond for habitat? Well, if we're talking about a new pond, then ideally you would remove most all the, the trees, the living trees, simply because they're going to be adding uh, leaf litter and other organic matter, you know, uh, seeds, fruit from the trees. Uh, so it's best to just get all the brush out of the pond initially. Then uh, maybe bring in some stumps and put some in as fish habitat. Um, it's good to have you know, there's not really a number of trees, uh, I guess. I would say, uh, think about more uh, from the perspective of how you want to fish your pond. Uh, put brush or stumps or logs in strategic places where you think that bass is going to hang out and it's going to provide you a good fishing location. Um, perhaps you uh, put some brush piles in different places for bluegill to hide. Uh, so you probably wouldn't want to put those in uh, 15, 20 feet of water. Maybe put them in that that two to six foot range, uh, giving small fish to hide. Uh, there's not really a a magic number. It's more your preference. Um, if you ask ten different biologists, you get ten different answers. Uh, but yeah, you know, it, it really just depends on what you have available to you as well. Um, so that would be one. I'd call your district fisheries biologist. Uh, send them some pictures of your pond and then maybe they can give you some ideas on where to where to start. Okay, thank you, Blake. And thank you, David, for answering those questions uh, while the presentations were going on. Jay, thank you very much for your information. Uh, thank you. It is a little bit past 8.30, but uh, uh, I think this is, and I see uh, we're, we're beginning to get people to drop off. So I think this is a good time to to call it. I think the majority of questions were answered by, uh, by folks. So with that, again, I thank everyone for joining us. If you do have other questions, I believe you do have uh, Blake's number and you have a link to find out who your local fisheries biologist is. Um, again, you can contact Jay or me if you have any questions on, on other op topics related to ponds as well. Um, and uh, Again, for anyone that didn't get those fact sheets and those links that I had provided to registrants that I sent to yesterday, feel free to email me and I will get those out to you. With that, uh, everyone have a, a good rest of the evening and we will go ahead and sign off. Thanks everyone. Thanks, Dwayne. Thank you. Okay. Dwayne, stop your recording. Thank you guys.